um, uh, Alberto and I um, have we've uh, based on this issue before in in the past. Um, I've, I've written and also taken part in terms of public policy very much as a defender of conscientious objection uh, for healthcare professionals. Um, uh, and I am the director of the Anscombe Bioethics Centre, which is the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Centre for Bioethics in Oxford. But today we're going to do something rather different and I'm going to, to um, uh, criticize the, the, the idea that there should be conscientious objection permitted in healthcare um, and test the strength of those arguments and uh, um, Alberto is going to do the opposite. So perhaps I just get, uh, ask you to introduce yourself first and then, then I'll start with my defense. Yeah, yeah thanks. So I'm uh, Alberto Giubilini and I'm a senior research, research fellow at the uh, Oxford Hero Center for Practical Ethics. Um, and uh, I've worked uh, quite a lot on uh, the ethics of conscientious objection in healthcare in the past. I'm currently writing a book on that. Um, and uh, yeah, as David said, uh, I made uh, a few times a case against uh, conscientious objection in healthcare. So I don't think that medical pro that healthcare professionals should be allowed to conscientiously object uh, to performing activities that are part of their job. Uh, but as David said, in this case, so the interesting thing about this debate today is that I will try to defend the view that uh, I disagree with. So the idea is to make the, stronger case, the strongest case possible for the idea that we both disagree with. And that should be interesting because it should uh, probably bring up, bring out the essence to the nature of the disagreement here and maybe might allow us to make some progress in the debate. So I think, so just to, so the structure will be, so David will be speaking for 15 minutes, defending the opposite view. I will be speaking for 15 minutes and then uh, we will have five minutes each uh, to reply. And then there is gonna be a Q and A and someone will moderate that. Yes, so yeah. over to you, David. So if you do have questions as you go through, um, do, do write them in the, in the chat, in the Q and A, and hopefully somebody will be able to pull out some of that uh, later on. So, uh, uh, so let's make a start on the issue. So the issue is: Should conscientious objection be permitted in healthcare? Should healthcare workers be permitted uh, 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 to uh, not have to um, uh, provide um, uh, uh, particular treatments or interventions if they have a conscientious objection? And I'm going to argue uh, no. I'm going to argue that we should not allow healthcare workers, at least we shouldn't allow them a generalized permission in advance. So that's what I'm going to argue against, a generalized permission in advance to providing treatments or procedures which go against the healthcare workers' uh, deeply held moral beliefs. Obviously, in a particular instance, somebody might say, I don't want to do this, and you might have a conversation, and in an ad hoc way, you might come to a different agreement. But we're talking about conscientious objection as a, as a practice, if you like, as a, as a kind of claim that, 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 that doctors or nurses can make if they say, um, no, I don't want to do this because it goes against my conscience, and I shouldn't have to do it. Um, so uh, what, what is the problem with, with, with accepting a right of conscientious objection, with accepting um, that people should be allowed to follow their consciences. Well, perhaps a, the easiest place to start is, is with positive actions, that we can see uh, that um, even though it is a good thing in general to allow people to act according to their conscience, um, uh, allowing people to, to, to act as they, as, uh, as they believe is right is a good thing, that does not give, and nobody, I think, thinks it gives um, a healthcare professional the right to break the law. If the law is broken, it's still um, that the law is broken by a positive act. So uh, let us say, for example, that the law prohibits uh, the encouragement of suicide, the encouragement or assistance of suicide, as it does in this country. But let's say I, as a, as a healthcare worker, a psychiatrist, say, uh, I disagree with this law, and I decide that I will provide for my patient a, a lethal drug uh, to a patient who is suicidal, because I think uh, in this case um, that's that's what would be good for my patient. Uh, well, I might think this, and I might think this conscientiously, 
but it would still be illegal and I would still be liable. And the fact that, uh, that I say uh, I, it, it, the law should be different uh, doesn't give me a right to do so, doesn't give me a right to do so without consequences for me. Uh, uh, and maybe I go to court and maybe I win in court, uh, but um, I am liable, prima facie, I'm liable. Uh, and this seems reasonable because we don't think that doctors should be a law unto themselves. Doctors are not a law unto themselves, nurses are not a law unto themselves, they, they fit within uh, a, um, uh, ideas of, of what we accept in, 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 in healthcare, which are accepted by society as a whole, which are laid down by society as a whole. And I think that, at least in some issues, in issues particularly around life and death, uh, issues such as abortion or infanticide or suicide or mercy killing, um, we think that these things are uh, and should be matters of law, matters on which the law decides what is permitted and what is not permitted. It is precisely because, indeed, that these matters of life and death are moral issues and ethical issues, not really te technical ones, that it is society as a whole which decides what is the view of the good and the just and the right in relation to these things that we should uphold in society. What are the values that our society wishes to hold in healthcare in relation to um, uh, matters of life and death. And this is not just true at a state level, I would say, but it's also true at the level of institutions, hospitals or professional bodies. Um, organizations have consciences. They have an institutional conscience uh, and the institutional uh, conscience reflects the values of that institution. Um, and if it's a professional body, the professional standards of that institution. That's what, how professions differentiate themselves from, from just uh, 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 groups of people with expertise. That people are committed to certain values and these values are then uh, encodified in, in their professional uh, uh, bodies. And this restricts what professionals are allowed to do. That's indeed the whole point of professional standards. Professional standards restrict professionals to working to certain standards. Um, and even though it's easier to see in relation to positive actions and in regards to prohibitions, the same thing holds in regard to duties. Um, a profession, a professional, uh, has certain duties as a professional uh, and that's what makes them a, a, a profession. Uh, so if somebody asks me for help as a healthcare professional and I refuse to provide and refuse to, prepare, to refer to one, somebody else to provide a particular uh, intervention which might be helpful, then uh, I may harm them. Uh, and that would then go uh, against my duty, uh, at least my prima facie duty, to help them. Imagine, for example, I'm a, a consultant um, who um, objects to referring children to intensive care if the, if the child is likely to survive only with cognitive disabilities. I'm, a, I'm a, of, a, of a kind of a hard utilitarian sort who thinks that people ought to be productive and if, if people are going to come out of, of intensive care with significant disabilities they shouldn't go into intensive care at all. Um, let's say I have this view and the parents want the child to go in into intensive care, but I say, no, no, uh, I, that goes against what I think is right. Do I have the right to object and refuse not only in my own case, but also refuse to refer to another doctor who I know would take a different view? Um, why should I, as the, uh, the, the healthcare professional in a, in, a, in a privileged situation, why should I exercise my power to, 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 to get in the way of accessing treatments that some doctors might accept or some doctors might not. Um, imagine again, and you'll see by my examples that, that uh, perhaps where I come from generally in, in terms of moral views, uh, imagine someone who is a, is a, a militant secularist, a uh, member of the, the perhaps National Secular Society and Secular Medical For Forum, uh, who refuses as a matter of conscience to inform chaplaincy services about a dying patient because he objects to the presence of religious ministers in hospital. And let us say, as a result of this refusal, uh, a, uh, a patient dies um, alone and without the support of, of uh, their, their own uh, faith tradition. Uh, in some cases, a case like that, 
somebody might have a conscience objection and it might be true that I mean it might be um, reflect their conscience but it may lead to harm physical harm or spiritual harm to somebody else um, and this this um, uh, there is a an indication that, that we can't at least have a have a uh, um, uh, an absolute view uh, of of the rights of conscientious objection um, but you might say, okay, let's have conscientious objection, but still with a duty to refer. Um, but if um, somebody objects um, to a procedure, um, uh, but you say, but you can object, but you have to refer to somebody else who'll do the procedure, how is that really respect for conscience at all? I mean, if I object to something because I think it will harm my patient, um, but you say I have to pass on that patient to another doctor who would do it and harm my patient for me because I don't want to get my hands dirty myself but I don't mind the patient being harmed that doesn't really respect conscience I think so the problem is either we respect conscience but then we might have uh, harms that happen because uh, of, of uh, my conscience being wrong or you might say uh, you might say well you have a duty to refer but then uh, but then uh, you may have harms that happen when the person is right to object uh, and, the, and the, 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 the patient would have been helped by, by following that conscientious objection. Um, uh, conscientious objection as an idea, we think of in terms of um, military service. That's one of the, the key uh, uh, elements of, of uh, conscientious objection. Going back to the 18th century, people have talked about conscientious objection. Uh, in, in relation to military service and in the United Kingdom in 1916 in the middle of the Great War the Military Service Act 1916 instituted conscription mandatory conscription unusual in Britain um, but allowed objectors to apply to military service tribunals though in fact the military service tribunals were generally very hard on uh, the objectors they were not sympathetic to the objectors and a lot of them they they said they didn't accept their objections and they sent them to the front anyway and people were then imprisoned uh, and traumatized um, but even where it did work um, uh, which was not universal conscientious objection in warfare has been seen as objection to the whole practice to being a soldier um, and it allows you not to have to be a soldier but it's not an objection to a particular procedure, um, not in general anyway, um, and neither is it an objection to a particular war. So there have been a number of attempts to say, um, for example, in the Vietnam War, this was a very big issue. Uh, there were people who said that they weren't pacifists. They accepted that you could sometimes have a just war, but the Vietnam War was not one, and so they objected to serving in that war. Their objections were not accepted, and they weren't accepted because the notion of conscientious objection was an all or nothing to do with a conscription and not to do with discretion. It didn't really cover that. So um, all in all, I think that the, the, the idea of conscientious objection uh, that happens in the military is so different to, to what's proposed for healthcare that it's not a very good model. And even if we accept that you shouldn't send people to fight uh, if they have an objection to fighting, I don't think that really uh, helps us to, to, to see w why, why we should have um, uh, conscientious objection within healthcare. After all, you don't get conscripted to be a doctor. Uh, in fact, you get paid rather a lot. So that's a difference between um, the kind of situation, the social situation of the conscript and of the doctor. Um, and more broadly, uh, and you can see this in relation to, 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 to also to warfare, if you have a conscientious object, allow a conscientious objection to a war, that isn't going to stop the war. That isn't raising questions about the war. That just allows some people to opt out of it. So the most fundamental question that somebody might have who objects to a practice isn't really being addre addressed by conscientious objection, as it might be by protest or by civil disobedience. And indeed, the crafting of laws which protect conscience in relation to, to, to particular procedures, almost always, and I can't think of an exception offhand, um, um, are part of laws to increase 
the practice which the person objects to, to increase the objectionable practice. Therefore, conscientious objection laws are, are always laws um, which are passed, which the person who objects would prefer the law not to be passed. So this is a rather curious thing that you have, in, in theory, a, a right which is enshrined by law in a law that per, a person would prefer not to have been passed. Um, uh, and uh, conscientious objection laws tend to be put forward as a kind of compromise, but really, therefore, to, 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 to help make more acceptable a law to introduce a certain practice. Um, and if you, have, if you think that the, the, the practice might be unethical or harmful, then, then to, to be in favour of conscientious objection might in fact be uh, to help promote the thing that you object to. Um, it's a kind of fig leaf for the acceptability of a practice. Um, so better, uh, rather than thinking about what my feelings are, to think about the practices and should these practices be part of medicine or not? Should assisting suicide be part of medicine or not? That's the key uh, question, rather than the idea of a conscientious objection, which is itself, I think, a very slippery notion and doesn't deliver uh, what uh, people who are in favour of the objection might uh, might hope. So I'm not arguing that there's no value in promoting inclusivity in working practices, or um, there's no value in, in trying to accommodate people's conscience uh, as part of uh, living together and working together in society. But the notion of a conscientious objection as a kind of practice or a right seems to me not a helpful model. Um, it gives the impression of an absolute right which is simply not credible. It, it encourages moral issues to be thought of as private, whereas moral issues are precisely public, I think. I think that the, the law is about the imposing of morality. Uh, and it promotes um, a weak compromise, which in the end satisfies neither the objectors nor the majority. And on this note, I will hand over to uh, Alberto to defend uh, conscientious objection. Okay, thank you. Um, that's very, was very convincing to me. Um, now, let me just remind you because some people might have come online a bit later. So what we are doing is we are defending the position we don't agree with. So if you hear me talking now about in favor of conscientious objection, that's precisely because I disagree with that idea because I'm, I'm disagreeing with what I'm about to say. So, but anyway, here is, my conscience hat on, and here is my strongest case uh, in favor of conscientious objection in medicine. And the obvious starting point for me uh, is uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which says that people, every human being, has a right to freedom of uh, thought, conscience, and religion. Um, so these three things are put together, but the idea of conscience is really the, the most important concept here because uh, we have to remember that when we talk about conscientious objection, we often think about objections based on personal and religious views, but the notion is actually quite broader because people might be morally, uh, strongly opposed to certain practices, for example, most obviously abortion, uh, quite independently of their religious views. So the first thing to clarify is that conscientious objection is not meant to be a privilege for religious people. It's not just about religion. Uh, so the principle of freedom of conscience is a secular principle that applies to uh, any moral view, whether religiously based or not. Um, and actually, it should be people who are not religious, people who are uh, secular in a sense that should be strongly in favor of conscientious objection because freedom of conscience and freedom of religion are uh, some of the basic uh, principles uh, of uh, liberal societies uh, and they are not really related to any particular religious view. Now, if we talk about freedom of conscience, so we want this concept of freedom to be meaningful. Um, so what does it mean to be free to do something? Uh, of course, none of us is completely free to do anything. There are always limits uh, that the law or that social expectation pose on things that we can do. Um, but we want the concept of freedom to be meaningful uh, and so we want the limits that are posed on our freedom 
to be as uh, uh, small or as minimal as possible. Um, and uh, in the case of the healthcare profession, if the condition for entering this profession uh, that in theory we are free to choose, everyone is free to choose whatever profession they want. So if I am limited in my choice of joining a certain profession because something that belongs to the profession, a few particular practice in that profession uh, are things that I morally uh, disapprove of, I'm morally against these practices, then it means that for me the choice is really between uh, preserving my moral integrity and choosing to enter a profession. And to me this sounds like a strong limitation of freedom of a conscience. So one might say, yes, you're free to, <laughs> to choose a profession, but once you choose a profession, then you have to stick to whatever requirement the profession uh, entails. But that's really not compatible with uh, a meaningful notion of freedom of conscience because it's quite a high price that I have to pay for uh, my free choice to join the profession. So if we want the, co the concept of freedom of conscience to be meaningful, we need to make sure that the choice to join a certain profession is really a free choice um, and the, the price that people would have to pay is not too large. Um, so this is the first consideration uh, in favor of conscientious objection in, in healthcare, and it's really rooted in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which is a, one of the fundamental codes <laughs> regulating our societies. Um, so this is the first thing. The second thing is related to the importance of uh, moral integrity. Now, when we talk about conscientious objection in healthcare, although there are lots of uh, uh, practices that in theory, and sometimes also in practice, healthcare professionals can object to. So the most obvious examples, the, the main uh, practice, the, the main, the, the stereotypical case of conscientious objection is because of a doctor or a healthcare provider, more generally, that, that doesn't want to take part in uh, abortions. Uh, now, abortion is obviously, obviously a very controversial, ethically, ethically controversial issue. Uh, it is widely debated, there is a lot of disagreement about the morality of abortion, uh, but if I am uh, uh, morally opposed to abortion, either on secular grounds or on religious grounds, and if I'm required by my uh, job contract to perform an abortion, that to me is equivalent to being asked to perform, uh, to murder someone. So if for me abortion is this morally equivalent as murder, uh, asking me, requiring me to perform an abortion would be a requirement to violate, so seriously violate my moral integrity. And to the extent that we value moral integrity, uh, that is really something that I should not be required to do, uh, at least for those practices that can be reasonably be, uh, thought to be ethically problematic and abortion or euthanasia, for example, where it is legal is one of those things. Um, so you, you, you would not ask anyone to murder someone and in the same way you should not ask a conscientious objector, someone who has a strong moral opposition or a religious opposition to abortion or euthanasia to perform these activities which to these people are equivalent, morally equivalent to murder. Um, now of course people who argue against conscientious objection, they sometimes make this argument about uh, uh, a sort of slippery slope argument. So the idea is that if we allow conscientious objection in the case of abortion or euthanasia uh, or uh, some other controversial part, maybe IVF, uh, then any doctor can object to any, any healthcare provider. Not just, so we're not talking just about doctors, we're talking about healthcare professionals more generally, like nurses, for example. So any, any healthcare professional can object to literally anything. So what, what is the limit? For example, Muslim doctors can object to medically inspecting people of the opposite sex, um, which happen. Uh, so wh where, where do we stop? So what was the principle? But typically those who argue in, f in favor of conscientious objection, uh, like me, um, so they, they, they wanted to set some boundaries to this. So if you take something like abortion, so abortion is not the same as uh, giving vaccines or antibiotics. So abortion is quite a peculiar practice. So there is a lot of reasonable disagreement about abortion. And it is not so obvious that abortion is or should be part of healthcare. So whether abortion is healthcare uh, is quite a, a controversial topic and is one of those things where 
there is a reasonable disagreement. Uh, to many people, abortion is not properly healthcare, and therefore it should not be part of the requirements of healthcare professionals. So abortion, uh, the, the reason is, for example, that some of them might think that quite plausibly that uh, pregnancy is not a disease and therefore uh, a healthcare provider is not under any at least ethical obligation but probably also professional obligation to uh, to provide uh, abortion because there is no disease to be treated uh, so that's one view and indeed that may be the reason why many medical codes of many medical associations worldwide do have conscious clauses so do allow conscientious objections uh, so I would say that wherever there is some reasonable disagreement, for example, in the case of abortion, then conscientious objection should be allowed uh, because it makes sense to be against the idea that abortion is healthcare, for example, and the same for euthanasia, for example. Um, so we, we don't need to commit to the idea that anyone can object to anything just because we allow conscientious objection to abortion. Um, now, there is another issue uh, about uh, conscientious objection to um, referring patients. So this is something that David mentioned as well. So one might say that, okay, if we allow you to object, to conscientiously object to providing a certain service, at least you need to make sure that your patient does receive this, the, the service that they are entitled to receive. Um, and that implies at the very least that you should, first of all, inform the patient that whatever they might need, they require is an option that is available to them. And secondly, facilitate access to this service by referring this patient to, uh, for example, one of your colleagues that you know is available to provide it. Uh, but again, that depends a lot on how any single healthcare provider conceives of the idea of complicity in wrongdoing. If someone is a committed Roman Catholic, for example, uh, then a referral, uh, for an abortion to a colleague is morally equivalent to uh, doing, to performing the abortion itself. So this would be a form of cooperation in wrongdoing that according to the Catholic doctrine is impermissible. So what the Catholic would call uh, material cooperation in wrongdoing. So it's not acceptable because it is the same thing as, uh, you know, if someone comes to you and asks you uh, to murder someone and you say, no, sorry, I cannot do that. But if you said, but let me, let me tell you, there is this guy down the road who you can go there and ask this guy and he would perform, the, he would murder this person for you. So that would be seriously ethically wrong for me. So in the same way as I should be free not to perform an abortion because of my moral integrity and because of my freedom of conscience, in the same way, I should not be required to refer someone for what it takes to be murder. Um, and after all, so as David said, uh, we do have conscience clauses in, in, in other areas and these are normally taken not to be problematic. So the most obvious example is the military conscription. Uh, so in the case of the military service, uh, it has typically been the case that pacifists, or more in general those who had some strong moral opposition to war, they were exempted from doing something precisely because of freedom of conscience. So the principle of freedom of conscience uh, is considered so important that people were allowed not to go to war, for example, even when that was a, an, an otherwise legal requirement in their country. So in the same way as someone can opt out from doing something that they consider morally wrong, in the case of the military service, in the same way that should be, so the same principle should be applied to uh, healthcare provision. Uh, because killing someone in war, for some people, is as morally wrong as killing someone, for example, a fetus, in a healthcare context. So there is no moral difference from the point of view of one's subjective morality. Um, we, we can also think about other cases in history where we now see that it was a good thing that we allowed, or not that we allowed, but that there were people who did conscientiously object to certain practices. So the most obvious example is the case of the Nazi medical practices and medical experiments. So now we, we know, now we see that what the Nazi did in most cases in, when they uh, carried out medical experiments was seriously, seriously morally wrong uh, because these experiments were performed without the consent of uh, participants. They were very harmful. They were clearly unethical by contemporary ethical standards. And back in those days, there were people who were 
who did conscientiously object to these practices. Some doctors refused to take part in these experiments precisely because they were unethical. Uh, so it was a good thing that people were allowed, no, sorry, okay, that people did conscientiously object whether or not they, they were allowed, that's not really the point here. The point is that in the same way, if we think of certain practices today, like for example, abortion or other things uh, done in the healthcare context like euthanasia, uh, it's good that there are some people who conscientiously object because these are a sort of uh, reminder like of being a bit humble when we make our ethical judgments about uh, healthcare uh, procedures because after all we might be wrong about the ethics of abortion we might be wrong about the ethics of euthanasia when i say ethics i mean what is encoded in current guidelines so maybe maybe it is true that abortion is ethically wrong and maybe it is true it, it is a good thing that these these days there are people who do conscientious objects because that reminds us that uh no we make mistakes in our ethical assessments May, maybe the current medicine is uh, not as bad as Nazi medicine, but is at least seriously ethically flawed. And conscientious objection, so a right to conscientious objection is a constant reminder that we should always be careful and always uh, examine the ethics of current healthcare procedures. I think I ran out of time, so is that right? That was 15 minutes, I suppose. Yeah, what do you think, David? That was, um, was well, well, I. I Obviously, I find myself um, agreeing with large parts of it, uh, despite myself, but um, um, I think um, uh, some things were a bit quick. Um, uh, and I, I just pick you up on the, uh, at, at the end, and I think it is, I, I think it is an important point. Um, the Nazi, the people who objected to, to, to um, uh, Nazi medicine, and we, we think of uh, um, um, the the uh, the twin experiments with in in Auschwitz and so on Mengele, but but more so really the the um, uh, euthanasia of of um, uh, uh, disabled people, uh, young people with cognitive impairments, large scale euthanasia practice, very um, um, very corrupting, very harmful. Uh, alas. Few people did object, most people went along with it, but some people did object. But they didn't object because they had a right to conscientious objection, which was enshrined. And they would not have wanted, and I would not want, a law which says, uh, yes, let's have large scale killing off of, of uh, uh, children with intellectual disabilities, but you get a conscience uh, clause um, with it. So um, the, the, the Nazis had neither of those things. They didn't have the conscience clause and they did have the bad medicine. So I agree that troublesome people, people who refuse, people who follow their conscience uh, are, are sometimes useful. But uh, I think sadly, if you do, then follow your conscience and sometimes you will have to pay a price for that. Uh, what I don't think is realistic is the notion that you can have an exemption in advance so you don't have to pay a price. So you can be exempt from doing these things. Um, um, so I say, well, I, I won't do it. I'll just have my, my, my exemption. Thank you. Um, and the rest of the practice will still carry on uh, uh, unaffected. And this is a problem I have with the way in which con conscientious objection seems to be set up as a sort of compromise. Um, the practice itself, the objectionable practice, is untouched and must carry on exactly as before. The person who objects is, is supposed to be completely protected. Uh, and I think that neither of those things are quite realistic. Um, if I object, it will have effects on other people. And if I object, I will probably have to pay a price for it. But I still, maybe I should object sometimes. Maybe I should refuse sometimes, but not because there is a right to, 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 to the practice of conscientious objection, not because that we have a general conscientious objection practice, but because um, uh, this is this is all all I, I can do. If I, I mean, if I worked in a in a in a supermarket, I might object to to selling cigarettes on the basis of health. Um, um, maybe they would accommodate this this maybe they wouldn't accommodate this if they didn't accommodate it uh, that might be a price that I, I might have to pay um, uh, and I might accept that 
uh, as part of the, the value of, of what I did um, uh, as a martyr, as in the traditional view. Um, uh, so I, I think that we should celebrate the martyrs and I think that we should do some, but I think that the compromise that we have with the, the practice of conscientious objection as a neat, as a neat compromise where the, co the objector doesn't have to pay a price and the, and, the, and the practice can go ahead untouched. I think that that's unrealistic as, a, as, a, as an idea, uh, as an ideal, and it tends to satisfy neither. Uh, and that, so that's my problem with, with, with conscientious objection. Not that you shouldn't sometimes object, and not that some practices might be wrong because the, 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 the institution can get things wrong um, and the, the, the law can get things wrong, certainly. But uh, the idea that I, um, the law could get things so wrong, but still get it right so that I can have my, my little objection, you know. Um, that's, that's, that's the thing that I find difficult. The notion of the neat uh, conscientious objection as a, as, a, um, as a get out of jail free card, um, um, but one which doesn't really touch the practice of the objectionable practice in medicine. Over to you. Okay, so just to quickly reply on this. So you, 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 I think, so we, we, we are moving up to different level at this point because you pick up the last point uh of my uh uh my argument and that was about so the nazi example the, the nazi example so now you, you're talking about the level of uh, the law so whether or not there should be a right to conscientiously object um i was in so that that's one one level and i provided some reason for why there should be such a right based on freedom of conscience and protection of moral integrity now that example was meant to address a different point that the idea is that sometimes conscientious objectors are actually doing the right thing, are doing the, a good thing, which is something that uh, people uh, opposed to conscientious objection often deny. So if some, if some people who are opposed to conscientious objection often would think that a doctor who refuses to provide an abortion is doing something wrong because the doctor is denying a woman uh, a right. Uh, and my point was meant to, to counteract that, that argument. So the idea is that maybe doctors or healthcare providers who conscientiously object are actually doing something good. So this is, this is a, a different layer. So it's not about whether it is right or wrong to allow conscientious objection. It's about whether conscientious objectors might after all be doing something that is the right thing to do. And after all, if you, if you think about, okay, the nice example, you, you, you can make the same point because imagine that so the Nazi were carrying out their experiments, their ethical experiments, but imagine there, there was like a clause in, 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 the, uh, in the law back then, allowing people to opt out from, like say, doctors to opt out of these practices. What would have happened is that probably, so if there, if there, actually, if there had been such freedom, and it, if it had been a real freedom, then probably most doctors would have opted out with the result that these unethical practices would never have happened. And maybe the same would happen now with abortion. If abortion is actually unethical, maybe it'd be good if people are like healthcare providers are actually free not to do that because that would actually change things, uh, which is something that couldn't happen in the case of the uh, Nazi experiments because there was no conscientious objection there. But if there had been conscientious objection back then, back then, then maybe most of the atrocities that we know that the Nazi did wouldn't have happened. Um, yeah, I think that's what I have to say about this. Now, um, I think, Liz, are you there? Or Michael? I am, yes, I'm here. How do we want to proceed with this? Well, we've actually got um, three questions come in already. Um, they're quite lengthy ones. Would you be willing to take questions now? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. 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 So are you happy to, to share this Q&A thing, Liz? Sorry? Are you happy to share this Q&A? I will do my best, yes. <laughs> okay, so the first question um, has come in from Valeria and is directed to David. Um, she says, again, this is quite a lengthy question, so bear with me as I, I read it out. In the debate, we mainly covered points concerning ethics and choice. However, from a pragmatic point of view, when conscientious objection creates threats to the life of citizens, how can we proceed? To better explain my question, in Latium, the region in which Rome is located, 
there are only four hospitals that choose to perform abortion, but of this four, in only one, there are doctors not objecting, to be precise, one doctor. This endangers the life of women in the region, especially those from less fortunate backgrounds. How can we ensure that if the Italian law permits abortion, this practice is provided to all and in a safe way? Thank you. Well, I, uh, thank you. Well, I'm, uh, I'm here to argue um, uh, against um, uh, conscientious objection, and that's a, a, a strong argument against conscientious objection, that uh, if you have in, in enough people object, then you don't have the provision of the service. So if the country as a whole uh, has thought that this is a good service to be provided, then, um, then there is a real problem about how you do that at the same time as, as uh, uh, allowing conscientious objection, particularly if there's no, uh, no sense of cost with regard to conscientious objection. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I think, uh, yes, precisely, um, if you object to abortion, then it is. It seems more me to me clearer that you just have a far more restrictive uh, kind of abortion law as Ireland used to have prior to about two years ago, um, um, and um, under that if you didn't have a, a conscientious objection uh, law. You had you had um, uh, uh, a law which was directed in regards to the to the to the, to, to the issue of abortion. If you if you have um, conscientious objection, which is in practice becoming a sort of a restriction on abortion, what you have is something which is very random and uneven, and it might be the one doctor does does lots of uh, lots of abortions which are which are um, uh, people who object to abortion would think were particularly bad, and other doctors um, uh, they they don't allow any kind of abortion at all, even in cases of of, of danger to the mother's life, um, cases which would have been acceptable in um, uh, probably would be acceptable in in law um so i think that is a problem with co conscientious objection if it le if it gets to the level of um of um uh, uh interrupting a uh, um the provision of a practice um so can, can you also add something about what i think a defender of conscientious objection would reply would answer so how a defender of conscientious objection would answer this question so assuming that I'm still doing that part, so I completely agree with the point of the question, but <laughs> assuming I'm still playing that part. So the main argument is that, would be that the right of women to access abortion, uh, so there is, no, there is no corresponding duty by any individual uh, to provide the service. So sometimes there are rights that people have, but there is no corresponding duty. So, uh, in the, in the case of Italy, for example, the, the fact that the, the women have a right to abortion simply means that abortion is legal, so it's an option, uh, it's not criminalized. But that doesn't mean that someone has the corresponding duty to provide the service. Um, if someone is, is available to provide it, that's good, so then it's fine. But we shouldn't uh, assume that individual healthcare providers have a right, have a, sorry, have a duty to provide the service. So this is what a defender of conscientious objection would say. It's not what I would say, but it's what the, the reply would be. Can, can we have another question, Liz? Yeah, I was just having a quick look through the question. So I think there's one uh, related to this, um, which is a question directed towards Alberto. Uh, and the um, attendee says, I believe that abortion is part of healthcare because prevention of disease or health promotion is considered to be part of a doctor's work and abortion by medical professionals can prevent some grave health related consequences, which may happen if abortion is conducted by non-medical professionals or if the woman continues the pregnancy. Is there anything else that you could explain more regarding uh, excluding abortion from healthcare? Is there any other example uh, other than abortion that you consider as not part of healthcare, even though it's in the current society? Um. Yeah, so I think the problem is, so there is a question about what is healthcare uh, and maybe related to what is a disease. So uh, what, one problem with this line of argument is that, so if, 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 you, if you consider something as part of healthcare simply because if there was no healthcare provider doing that thing, then things would be worse. So I, 
I think that this will be this will entail a too broad understanding of healthcare because there are, there are lots of things that would fall under this category if this is the criterion for inclusion into healthcare. Uh, for example, uh, don't let me think. Um, so, well, uh, well, that's, that's also quite controversial. So, uh, female genital cutting, for example, uh, is that part of healthcare? Um, so, many people would say no, but if someone says, yeah, but the alternative is that people do this thing, or even circumcision for males. So many people say, yeah, but if people do these things themselves, that would be worse. So we might as well have a doctor doing that. Uh, and then what about torture or uh, capital punishment? So are these things part of healthcare? Uh, I would say no, but if the alternative is, okay, we can torture someone without some medical experts that knows when, when it is too much. Uh, then uh, that would so it will be better to have a dog, but that doesn't mean that healthcare that torture is uh, healthcare. So the same would apply to abortion. So I, I, I'm afraid that that criterion sort of proves too much. So it, it, it conveys a notion of healthcare that is too broad. So I wouldn't go down that path. Can, can, can I also say that I think that even if something is not um, healthcare, is done by healthcare professionals, but is not healthcare, that doesn't mean to say that you, conscience um, has has more or less play there. Um, I think, um, I mean, if you just take capital punishment, say um, um, a, a, a prison decided that the, 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 they were going to have lethal injection, capital punishment, and it was going to be done by the doctor for the prison, and they made that part of the contract, then, they, then somebody is, might, they might uh, object, and then they might cease to be, you know, um, uh, um, they might uh, lose their job as the as the as the um, prison chaplain, but I think um, uh, it would seem a little odd to me to say, well, um, uh, we have let's have capital punishment, but let's 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 um, uh, allow uh, conscientious objection. I mean, they might say, well, we'll we we'll find it easier to get a, a prison doctor if we, we if we allow a little latitude here and we get somebody else in to do it. But it seems to me, if it, it, as a matter of contract, or say uh, I, I, I have a, a company that does that that that, that um, is involved in beauty products, and there are some there they, there's some cosmetic surgery, um, um, and so there are some uh, some doctors who do cosmetic surgery, and then <coughs> you have a have someone who objects to a particular kind of cosmetic surgery. They object to lightening the skin, or they object to changing the shape of the eyes to make them look more European. Um, so they say, oh, I won't do that. Um, I, I, well, I might accept that or I might not accept that, but it, 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 it seems to me that, the, that then the argument between the employer and the person who, as a, as a, a surgeon, does these things, um, it, it doesn't, it's not obvious to me that this is, is, is helped by having a, a category of conscientious objection, which is a, which is a sort of legal category. So, so um, I can't sack the surgeon if the surgeon doesn't want to do it, even if that's actually lo what a lot of the business entails. And the, f and the fact that, um, the fact that, uh, that it's healthcare or not, doesn't seem to, to me to be, to be a factor here. Um, what's a factor is just, do you need somebody to deliver a service? Are you, can you require somebody to give a service? Should people object? I think some people some, sometimes should object, but sometimes if you object, you'll pay a price. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there are some questions that are relevant to that that have come in, but there's, there's quite a lot of questions. So I think if we just continue to take them in order and hopefully we'll, we'll get some uh, order out of chaos. David uh, Battisti says uh, that this is a question for both of you. Thank you for your brilliant speeches. In your opinions, does arguing against conscientious objection mean being committed to a sort of moral objectivism or even a sort of moral realism? What uh, is the meta-ethical assumption that stands behind this argument? I don't know who wants to go first. Alberto, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so I, so I think so the, here is, is a bit complicated. Um, I think it, this will require some philosophical discussion that maybe is a bit too abstract for this kind of format, but so in short, I think yes. Uh, I'm not sure arguing against conscientious objection commits to some form of objectivism. What I think is that arguing in favor of conscientious objection commits people to some form of moral relativism. 
Um, so, no, now, now I'm speaking neither, in, neither as, as someone in favor or against. These, these are more like conceptual points. So I think that co like endorsing conscientious objection commits people to a certain form of moral relativism with regard to at least um, uh, well, the principle of medical ethics, but more generally, actually. Um, because the idea is that the position of those who say think a certain practice is ethical or requires certain practice, say abortion, and the position of those who are against this practice or think this practice is unethical are on equal footing. So the idea behind conscientious objection is that we need to respect both in the same way. So that's important. So people who are uh, in favor of conscientious objection, so they, it's not that they try to undermine the provision of the service. That's not the point. So the point is that it's really about my own moral integrity. So I want to keep my hands clean. So I, I, I really, I'm not interested in whether this person does or does not get an abortion or euthanasia or whatever. That's not my business. So I'm only interested in preserving my conscience, so my moral integrity. So the view here is that my view about abortion, my ethical view against abortion, should be given the same weight as the, the view of the person who requests abortion. So they are on equal footing. So in this sense, yes, I think defending conscientious objection commits people to a certain form of moral relativism, which I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but conceptually, I think that's true. I, I think, well, you have an irony here that the, 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 the traditions which are most uh, strongly opposed to moral relativism, which are objectivist in terms of natural law, uh, pro-life view about the status of the embryo and so on, they, they also have, have bought in to uh, conscientious objection as a way to preserve something when they can't get everything. Um, so, whereas the people, that, whereas uh, uh, the, the, the um, uh, advocates of, of uh, both abortion and assisted suicide, which are which are laws where you've uh, where you often have a statutory right for conscientious objection. <coughs> um, those <coughs> those have often come um, out of a, a, a of a sort of liberalism. So people have said, well, um, you can't you can't define in advance uh, what makes a good death, or you can't say um, uh, whether this is a whether this is va valuable or not, or wrong or not. So we should allow, because of uh, uh, pluralism, we should allow permissive laws on abortion, or we should allow permissive laws on on um, uh, uh, assisted suicide. And in theory, those would also go with. Uh, uh, moral pluralism uh, for as a basis for conscientious objection. So I think that you can have both. You can both have um, <coughs> objectivists who want to have some conscientious objection, uh, and you can have pluralists who want to have some conscientious objection, and you can have uh, pluralists who think that that um, uh, you. Um, no, I've got my, myself confused, but I think that, that there are there were ways in which both thing, both both of those views can be can be um, uh, accepted. I think. Um, um. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question for Roger Crisp, um, who says he thinks this is a question mainly for David. Um, what about a country in which everyone believes that there should be a legal right to conscientious objection, or one in which the majority believes this? Um, so, um, well, the, so the, pro some of the problems I, I had with, with, um, uh, conscientious objection, well, conscientious objection to what I would start with. And, and typically it's at least in law, it's been conscientious objection, for example, to conscription. Uh, so you have conscription, but you have conscientious objection, but you still have conscription and you still march off people to war with very little protection in terms of vo voluntariness. You don't have a voluntary army, you have a conscripted army, but you have some little exception. So the, the, the problem with conscientious objection, I think as a, as a model, people might have it, but it, it, ironically, it might be a more um, uh, heavy handed kind of uh, society than one where you had genuine voluntariness. 
I mean, that's that's more that's most obviously the case with war, but that might also be the case in in other areas of of, of healthcare, um, and and in regards to, to things like uh, abortion and 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 assisted suicide, I would say, well, what 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 is the function of these uh, of these conscientious objection uh, laws in um, um, uh, conscientious objection uh, uh, elements within the law? Clearly, laws have passed the Abortion Act 67, the California End of Life Options uh, um, Act of, of uh, 2016. Laws have passed which involve conscientious objection. And so there has been majority support for particular laws with conscientious objection. Uh, I just um, uh, worry about the, 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 the effect of those laws, that they might both be laws that allow things that I think uh, I, I would prefer to restrict rather than allow, um, and um, they, they, they are more heavy handed than, than, than genuine voluntariness um, in, in areas of society. So I think that the, the notion of conscientious objection might be problematic, even if it were popular. Thank you. Alberti, do you want to comment on that at all? or? Uh, I... No, I think it's a yes. Okay, <laughs> right. We have a question from Ron and Gillen. Uh, might you both perceive the issue uh, of killing, I think that is, and the contentious is issue of the moral status of the fetus? Does this agreement about that entail moral rel relativism? Relative. Ugh. Take it away. <laughs> um, so, I, should I go first? So, well, I don't think this agreement entails moral relativism. Uh, what I think is that, so because if you have disagreement, it might be the case that someone is right and someone is wrong. It's not that per se disagreement is a sign of anything. Uh, well, otherwise, moral relativism would be true because we all disagree about lots of things. Uh, the point is that, uh, the point is that what you decide to do with disagreement, with, with disagreement, uh, that might point to some form of moral relativism. For example, in this case, so the idea that we decided since we have disagreement, then we want to allow conscientious objection and therefore give all the positions, say, equal weight. So we should respect the view of those who object. We should respect the view of those who think that abortion is fine. So pluralism itself, again, that doesn't entail relativism, but uh, again, pluralism, would require people to still to, to make some, it's not that the, because we endorse pluralism, then we, in the name of pluralism, we allow everything. We still need to decide what falls within the realm of what some might call reasonable pluralism and what falls outside. But that means that once we are within the realm of reasonable pluralism, then everything within this sphere is, should be respected in the same way. Uh, and that aspect of pluralism, of reasonable pluralism, at least to me, entails some form of ethical relativism. Uh, in terms, for example, if you ask, uh, so how should we treat all these positions? And if the answer is that we sh they should all be on equal footing, we should respect them all within a context of pluralism, that in entails a, a form of Relativism. So it's not disagreement per se, it's the way we treat this disagreement when we put all this position on equal footing that points to some form of relativism, as I see it. Um, I, I, and I think that the, um, I, I think I agree with, with Alberto that, that it isn't about the fact of disagreement. Um, and there is disagreement, and disagreement doesn't imply pluralism. It doesn't imply relativism. I, I think we, uh, we're both agreed about that. Um, um, but the question is what you do with disagreement uh, and how you manage disagreement. Um, uh, uh, even disagreement within the realm of the, of the reasonable. And um, uh, I think where, where where large bodies within society, communities within society, have fundamental disagreements about uh, uh, moral issues, then that does that does create a problem for um, harmony within society, and it does create a problem for how we live live together and how what we deliver. It's it's particularly problematic because of healthcare. Now, if we have a, a national healthcare system or a largely insurance-based healthcare system, which is very systematic. Uh, it, it is, there's a question about what you provide or, or, or don't provide. Where are your defaults? 
Um, so I think that, that we have to find ways within society of managing um, the fact of disagreement at the same time as trying to commit ourselves to coming to correct views uh, which will protect vulnerable people. Uh, I'm just not convinced, or at least I'm here presenting, <laughs> um, in regard to conscientious objection, um, how useful this particular mechanism is. So conscientious objection is really one very narrow mechanism for dealing with some kinds of disagreement. It doesn't deal with, uh, with there's a whole range of disagreements that it doesn't deal with. Um, and, um, and it's just really about, and it's not also clear what it means in terms of what, what, is, what does it mean to be permitted? Does it mean that you necessarily keep your job? Does it mean that um, you, you can, you can uh, take a job where, which you normally would have a lot of this practice there? It's not, it's not clear what, um, what is implied by conscientious objection. So I think that you can have questions about the usefulness of conscientious objection as a way to deal with disagreement, uh, at the same time as acknowledging disagreement, and at the same time as saying that disagreement doesn't mean uh, necessarily relativism. Thank you. I think uh, Kerry has a, a good question to follow on from that. And uh, they say, when, when do you say that an objection is conscientious? When are objections in healthcare a matter of preference uh, rather than of conscience? It's for me or for, me? for either of you, I think. You want to go first, David? Because I was. Yeah, my objections are conscientious and yours are matters of preference. <laughs> uh, well. and, and, the, and there is a difficulty of, I mean, there are procedural rules uh, that you can, you can say, well, this is procedural, but I, I think there is a question about uh, if people don't want to do something, when do you say, well, this is the kind of this person doesn't want to do something which I'm going to give a very high status to and respect and this is the uh, an example of the person not wanting to do something that I'm not going to respect and I'm going to to, to penalize them in some ways um, and um, the the distinction between the two doesn't seem to me obvious uh, uh, at all um, but perhaps um, perhaps uh, uh, Alberta can so what, I think what, what a defender of conscientious objector was like me would say is that so it's really, in practice it's difficult to distinguish what is conscientious objection and what is just objection based on mere preference or convenience. Uh, for example, abortion is not a very pleasant procedure. So what what reassurance I have that a doctor objects based on conscience rather than based on convenience that they just don't want to perform these things. Uh, that's true, but one might say that uh, there are certain things that we can reasonably presume are a matter of conscience. For example, abortion for Catholic healthcare providers, that's very likely to be a matter of conscience um, because we know that abortion is considered a grave moral sin by the Catholic Church. Uh, whereas if someone objects, for example, to vaccination, say, say if a doctor objects to vaccination, then we have more reasons to doubt that there's really a conscientious objection because as much as one can be opposed to vaccines for all sorts of reasons, uh, it's very unlikely that it's a matter of conscience in the same way as it is in the case of abortion or euthanasia or contraception or IVF or, well, there are borderline cases like animal experimentation, for example, it might be difficult to, to tell, but there are some clear cases in which you can be relatively sure that something is really a matter of conscience. Although I agree the, the concept of conscience is quite tricky. We have a question in from Emma for the person speaking for conscientious objection. Uh, in relation to conscientious objection in medicine, you said that doctors should be able to object only to topics which are seen as polemical, uh, such as abortion, by many people, so that doctors do not start objecting to everything. But in that case, it seems to me the right to conscientious objection on an individual level will not be fulfilled because every individual choice or objection should be dependent on or determined by the social general choice. How is this an individual conscious objection? Mm. So I think someone in favor of conscientious objection would probably not agree with the last part of the question, the last part of the point, because they wouldn't, we wouldn't say that social norms or social expectations should not set boundaries to just to, to conscience. Uh, because no one is really arguing for 
unlimited conscientious objection. And the idea is that since we live in a society where we need to make compromises all the time, uh, then even the right to conscientious objection is limited by, for example, some basic social norms or social expectations. The point is that these boundaries are not dictated by, by what is legal or not, so to what people have a right to receive or not. But it's always the case that every right we have, even if we believe in a right to conscientious objection, even if you think that conscience is super important, is, it will never be an absolute right. So there are, because, for example, my conscience can tell me to go and, I don't know, kill my annoying neighbor, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I'm joking, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that because, uh, and rightly so, society and the law prevents me from doing that. So even the most strenuous defender of conscientious objection would never say that the right to, con to conscientious objection is an absolute right. And it makes sense there are social expectations that limit this right. I don't know if this addresses the question. <laughs> David, do you want to comment at all or should we move on to... Uh, I think we can move on. Right, we have a question for Peter. Um, I suspect this might start quite a debate. Now that both of you have argued for and against this issue, and I mean you as individuals have defended both positions in separate forums on different days, what could a compromise between the two positions look like? Do you see any avenue for negotiation or a practical way forward? So this might be a good moment to, to like, <laughs> go back to again, right? Because the, I think this question is is a good bridge to. Yes, let's try. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, okay. So you you want to go first or there? Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I will now uh, we will now switch hats uh, and I will uh, defend conscientious objection. Um, I, I think. Um, I don't know in advance. Um, this is this is in a way the second um, attempt with 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 Alberto to have a have a um, a discussion of a different kind. The first time we tried to have a discussion where we agreed about what we disagreed about, mm. which, believe it or not, is really difficult. It's really difficult to have a have honest agreement where you have properly ca ca characterized the 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 opposite view and then say, can we, can we define what we disagree about? Um, and I think probably uh, um, we have to go back to that. I think that, that um, uh, one thing that uh, Alberto said right at the end, nobody's defending an absolute right of conscientious objection. I think um, I, I would agree with that. So, so the, then the question is, um, uh, if we think of other kinds of liberties and inclusivity, what um, what might what might other concepts add to this? Because I, I I do think I mean, and this is where, where I partly agree with the opposite view I'm I'm arguing against. I do think conscientious objection, at best, is a very limited thing, and is is something which is often misunderstood. So that we may make more progress with conscientious objection if we add it to questions like um, academic freedom, um, um, uh, freedom of association, uh, uh, tolerance in society, and, and other kinds of, of liberties, uh, and then see how it might fit. But, but um, uh, it's um, work that has hardly started in terms of work in progress. Uh, Alberto. Um, yeah, so, yeah, with regards to compromise, that's, that's interesting because conscientious objection is itself already a compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite, quite a, a significant compromise. And uh, so the question now is how we compromise between what already is a compromise and something, something else. Now, I don't think that we need to compromise further, but I... I if I can, if I may, like reframe the question. So, at what level should we have this discussion? And I think there is already enough room for discussing about the ethics of certain healthcare procedure, uh, because we, fortunately, we are still living in a society where there is, as David said, freedom of speech, uh, academic freedom. Now, it is true that we are going in the wrong direction in this respect. So, but there is still enough room for debating about, for example, whether abortion should or should not be part of the medical profession. 
I think we should have this kind of discussion. We should have a discussion about what they say about euthanasia, about anything that is controversial. And that's the place where this kind of disagreement should come up, I think. Uh, I'm open to arguing with people who think abortion should not be part of the healthcare profession, uh, which I did, uh, by the way. And I think we should have the debate at that level. And there is, you can have as much disagreement as you want at that level. The point is that once we decide, right or wrongly, that something is legitimate part of, a, of the profession, then when it comes to dealing with patients who need a certain service, that's really not the place to bring up ethical issues. You can, you can campaign against abortion, you can, have a, you can have a debate about changing the medical codes about abortion, and that's fine. But the point is that if we bring the disagreement down to the you know, level of the, the, the bedside, so when we are actually in front of a patient, uh, or when, yeah, or when we had need to fulfill some responsibility of the healthcare system that we work for, then I think that's really not the place to have this disagreement. So I'm happy to have, I'm happy to compromise, but not at the level of healthcare derivative. I'm happy to compromise at the level of setting up guidelines for the profession, because healthcare professionals are monopoly provider or whatever service uh, we think the healthcare profession should provide. It's not that if, if, if a woman cannot have abortion from the healthcare providers, they can go somewhere else. So they have a monopoly and therefore there is a responsibility to provide that service. So I think we need to be clear about where we are going to have this disagreement, at which level. Well, I, I think that last point is very interesting because there is a question of whether, whether there is a, the, a, a problem here is the notion of a monopoly. Um, because um, if you had, uh, if you had um, areas of healthcare, uh, forms of delivery of healthcare, which were informed by different uh, uh, subcultures and communities, then you could have, uh, as you do in the United States, but not in, in this country, then you might have uh, hospitals where you didn't have abortion and hospitals where you did have abortion, for example. And, um, and you, have, you can have a, a, an ethos and a culture um, uh, uh, within, um, but that's only possible if you don't have a single monopoly. There is a, there is one provider which is the state, and everybody who works for the state does the same thing, and everybody who signs up for it has to do it in the same way. I think that might be a be problematic. I mean, I'd say with abortion, even in this country, uh, most abortion is paid for by the NHS, but not delivered through the NHS. So you do, you don't, you actually don't have, in terms of provide, who's doing the providing, you have um, third sector prov provision, and then you have um, paid for from outside and paid for by the state. So you do actually have a variety, and and that variety could be cultivated to be different, um, uh, and that would allow people to practice within and also to seek out ways of delivering service, which were more in 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 context with the in the, in the context of a of a, an understanding of healthcare that they had. We've had uh, a few comments coming in saying that um, individuals haven't necessarily found it that helpful to have uh, you swap perspectives. Um, presumably there are people here who, who know your views in, in general. Um, would either of you be able to say uh, whether you found the experience helpful yourselves in uh, articulating your arguments? So, so do, do you mean that um, swapping back wasn't helpful or swapping until now wasn't helpful? I think swapping until now wasn't helpful. Okay. Well, well, p p perhaps if we, sw uh, now we've started to swap back, if we swap, if we comment on that, then, then that might be more I illuminating. I mean, I think that uh, for, for, um, uh, for me, it, for me, it has been helpful, and I think that perhaps in terms of the timing of where we are, that, that's that's probably good. Um, for, for for me, it's it's been helpful to think in terms of if I am in favour of conscientious objection, which I am, uh, I th need to think of examples where the person who is objecting is wrong, and so I'm defending a right of somebody who is who is in error. Um, out of kind of liberty. What tends to happen is people in favour of, of conscientious objection take examples where they agree with the objector and people who uh, are against conscientious objection take examples where they, they, they disagree with the objector and that, that's not helpful because of conscientious objection is essentially a procedural thing 
And so it's good to test it with examples where you don't agree. Um, and so I think um, that I found useful and I do accept and I think it is useful for people who are in favor of conscientious objection to think what are the limits of conscientious objection and um, if you're going to defend it how can you defend it if you don't defend it as an absolute and how can you defend it if you don't defend it on the basis of, 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 of um, a relativism um, are there still ways to defend a conscientious objection as a as a um, a principled compromise for certain purposes um, um, and that's um, that's what what I got I mean I think I'm sure sometimes Alberto was frustrated with my presentation of 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 the, the views against um, I was sometimes frustrated with his um, a presentation of, of, of what somebody would say um, I, and though I sometimes agree with him sometimes I, I disagreed with him and in particular on this objectivity thing I, 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 I'm a strong objectivist I think that some people uh, if we disagree about an issue then um, either, um, either I'm right and you're wrong or you're right and I'm wrong or we're both wrong um, or, or uh, uh, at the very least, we're wrong about each other. We've misunderstood each other. Um, so, I, um, I, and I don't think that's necessary. Um, and that I have found useful in trying to argue for the opposite case. But I'll, I'll bet I'll leave. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm on the same page with that uh, about that. Um, so to me, the, so the main thing is that this is true for this debate, but in, indeed for most debates in bioethics, as far as I know. So. The, the most common thing that I see people doing is like arguing against a straw man. Um, so that's something that, although, although we all know that we shouldn't do that, but it is surprisingly difficult to avoid building up the straw man and arguing against it when you argue against a certain view. Uh, and I, I'm aware I'm, already, I'm also guilty of, of doing that, although I know that's not really good academic practice, but I'm surprised sometimes to see how much you know, straw man, <laughs> this kind of, of practice is, is widespread in academic debate. So, and the point of doing this thing is trying to uh, like avoid the, the, this strategy. So I, I generally wanted to convince, like, and I, didn't, I, gen I generally want to make the strongest case against my view because that's really a way of avoiding building up straw man. And, and it's interesting that, that David said that he wasn't often always happy with the way I you know, reported his view. And it was the same for me. Sometimes I think he's sort of misconstrued uh, my, my actual position. And, but not, not, not intentionally. So I, I didn't do it intentionally. And I'm sure he didn't do it intentionally. It's just that we have in our mind a clear idea of the things we are against too. And uh, the way we build up this idea is, is, is such that we, you know, we make it, as easy as possible for us to you know, take or to dismiss uh, these uh, opposite views. And I think th this exercise is very useful. I will be happy to do it with regard to other topics, say abortion, like abortion itself, not conscious objection, because that's really, really an interesting case. Because I think, for example, there are good arguments against abortion. I think there are. I don't think they're good enough, but I think they are good and it's worth exploring. And I'd be interested to do the same thing because we need to avoid engaging with this kind of Stroman strategy with each other. I think it might have been helpful had we said at the beginning, and this is retrospect, but perhaps get people to, th to think about it, um, to have invited people when they asked questions also to, to, to do so from the opposite perspective. Um, that, that, that's what we had tried to get people to think about. So even if they didn't, even if you had questions and your, the questions were very much in terms of, of uh, a view you disagree with and what's wrong with that view, um, I think it's useful to think in terms of what you heard and say, well, if I held the opposite view, if I held the opposite view, what kind of questions would I want to ask to push the speaker? What, what kind of questions would I, from the opposite uh, perspective, would I, I like to push? And that's what, um, um, what would have been good to do. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the format is... Um, challenged us a little bit because obviously we had wanted to do this face to face and we had the idea of you having the hats so people could keep track of the arguments a bit more. Um, so perhaps if we do, uh, you know, do this again, um, perhaps in person, we might 
think about how we can get that um, audience swapping going on as well. Um, just following on from that, Ranan uh, has, is commenting that um, they use the technique of arguing against one's own position as part of their annual course on medical ethics. Um, and he would like to know whether either of you have learned anything from this exercise. I know you've both said it's been challenging and uh, good to, to construct your own arguments uh, against each other's positions, but have you actually learned anything about the alternative standpoint, as it were? Yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, yeah. So the main thing is that I think what I learned is that probably the main point of disagreement in this debate in this debate is about so the nature of healthcare, about what is what is not part of healthcare. Because it seems to me that all the problems turn on that that issue. Um, because if if we agree that say abortion is part of healthcare then there's a strong reason for against that you against conscientious objection but if we agree that abortion is not part of healthcare uh maybe the case for conscientious objection is weaker but the problem is what criteria do we should we adopt to decide whether something is or is not part of healthcare um so this is something i learned in a sense like build, trying to build up the argument against my position i think it showed me that that's maybe the most difficult point to address if I want to make the strongest case possible against conscientious objection. I need to make an argument uh, about why abortion is part of healthcare or should be part of healthcare. Um, I think I've um, uh, I've come to think of conscientious objection as a as an institution or as a, as a practice as something which needs to be um, clarified or, 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 or interrogated. Um, and, um, and I think it's a classic case of people using it as a proxy for other things. So uh, people use it as a proxy for the, so if you're against uh, abortion, then you're in favor of uh, conscientious objection to abortion. Um, and it's just a proxy for being against abortion. So it's not about conscientious objection itself. It's a proxy for, for another kind of argument. And, and um, I've, uh, I, I think I've, I've come more to, th to think and, and to think I need to think more about what is the role for conscientious objection uh, alongside other ways of dealing with um, uh, disagreement um, reasonably um and and when it might not actually be a when it when it might not actually be a very useful category um and uh i'm i think uh, some of this some of this relates to the difference between the question should you follow your conscience and should you expect anybody's help when you follow your conscience. <laughs> and the first I have no difficulty with, but the second I can see that if people disagree with you about, about the, the results, then, then you sometimes should do the, the difficult thing, but you shouldn't necessarily expect people to, to, to agree with you. And, and, and I've become more suspicious of, of purely procedural ways of dealing with disagreement without looking at what we're disagreeing about. Thank you. Uh, Johan uh, is just continuing that thought. He says, thank you for this wonderful discussion. On the topic of different levels of compromise, uh, what do you think of a solution where society grants healthcare workers the freedom to request a referral, but without a guarantee that the request will be granted? Assuming that some requests are granted and some are not, is this truly a compromise or is the protection of conscience so weak that it can no longer be called a right to conscientious objection? The right of referral is a really knotty one. And I think it, it, it is because <coughs> without some kind of right of referral, I'm, I'm not sure uh, a right not to refer, then there, there's a real problem with conscientious objection. But, but I'm not sure how you 
deliver an equal service if I just put in that in that in terms of what people are what people um, uh, wish wish to be provided and think is reasonable to be provided how you do that at the same time as, as not having referral but um, I, I would ask that the person thinks of examples where they wouldn't want to refer things of examples of things they object to say say for example um, uh, therapy um, um, uh, therapy to change your sexual orientation okay so um, um, therapy to uh, uh, psychotherapy aimed at uh, um, uh, changing unwanted same-sex attraction so you have somebody who says well this is just about freedom um, you have this out there it's a it's a free market there are these people um, um, uh, I go to a psychotherapist and I say uh, if you don't give this to me, can you point me in the direction of someone who will give psychotherapy for same-sex attraction? Um, and if you think that this, this kind of therapy is um, likely to be harmful, then for that reason, you won't, won't want to provide it. But you won't want to refer to it, um, even if it's legal. Um, uh, you might want also to be campaigning in the meantime for it not to be legal, but while it is legal, um, you, you, you might want not want to, to, to provide it, but it is a it's a real practical difficulty to to know how to um, protect a right not to refer at the same time as having other people uh, provide where we we as a society have thought that things ought to be allowed to be provided. Um, I don't know if that's. Yeah. I, think, I think I get that because that's a bit of a problem. Uh, of con it's a problem of consistency. If 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 you if you allow conscientious objection to certain practices, then you need to apply the same criterion to referral, because to some people really. So if you assume that conscience matters that much, so to some people referral is really as bad as doing the, the actual thing. So um, yeah. So if you apply one criteria for conscientious objection to performing things, you need to apply the same for conscientious objection to referral. Now, to me, this is a reductio. To me, this means that we should allow conscientious objection in the first place. I suppose David will go in the opposite way. Uh, so, so, so if I can give a, a, a counter, I agree with that, but I, I give a counter and that's when you have professional disagreement. So if the disagreement is not about conscience, but it's about, um, I don't think, um, 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 I don't think that, that, that this kind of procedure is, is useful for, for, this, um, um, for this disease. There's a, there's a professional disagreement about that. There are some people who think th this is the next thing. I, I've read the evidence. I don't think it's the next thing. Um, what happens is uh, if you, you can say, I, don't want, I will not refer you for this because I don't think it will be good for you. But you have the right to seek a second opinion. But I'm not going to tell you who out there uh, I, I disagree with because I disagree with them so and I don't have a duty to find someone who has a, some crackpot idea that I disagree with what I have a, a duty to, to do is say this is what I think you have a right to another opinion if you disagree with me but I don't have a, a have a right to, to, to uh, um, I don't have a duty to refer to someone who I know has a diff different view um, I, I could point you in the direction of how you find a second opinion, but but not specifically. Thank you. I, I think I have a duty to uh, point out that we're very very close to the uh, the end of this this meeting. So um, I just want to say thank you very much uh, to everyone who's joined us, and to, to you, David and Alberto, for your incredible thoughts uh, and uh, amazing way of handling each other's others perspectives and um, I'm conscious that we haven't managed to get through all the questions so I do apologize for that but it sounds like we've got quite a lot of material to have another debate <laughs> again yeah. in the future so we will um, keep everyone posted uh, on that and um, David I know you had uh, a couple of events that you wanted to share with with people just before we we wrap up 